meaning in Scripture is never apart from its context. And you got to preach enough of the context so that people don't hear you saying what you want to say, but hearing you say what the writers actually said and actually meant. All right. So from uh, verse number 10 through the end of the chapter. And I want you to see how Paul is going to frame this argument because it, it can be real easy to get lost in the details. Uh, beginning at verse number 10, the Apostle Paul is going to give a plea for unity. He's going to ask them to be unified. When we get there, I want you to, I want you to notice what he means by unified. Right. He's going to actually spell out what he means by unified, because for most of us, when when God talks about unity, we talk about just uh, being in agreement to the point where we don't talk about what divides us. And, and that's not how what Paul is going to have in view. He's going to tell us what unity looks like when he asks the Corinthians to be unified. And then unlike the Philippians, um, uh, the, the Philippians passage in chapter two, Paul's going to say exactly what their division is. He's going to tell us exactly what they are dividing over. Now, th this is going to be a little bit more important because the application of, of the theology then is going to be in a very particular area. And that's why it differs a little bit di from what he told the Philippians about their lack of unity. All right. L Philippians is a general unity a general division, if there are any. But this one, he is going to attack a particular issue because, and I love the thought of this, there's one, long, there's one young lady who gets, whose name gets recorded for all of posterity who is the one who has snitched to Paul about what's happening. <laughs> I love that. Uh, she, she, Paul is going to say, I heard from Chloe and her people <laughs> that there's some division there. And he's going to tell us what the division is. And then watch this. Here's, this is where it becomes important for us to understand the flow of his argument. Here's what Paul is going to do. He's going to tell the Corinthian believers the plan of God that's all wrapped up in this grand experiment of God to save people and why how God does it makes the factions or the divisions antithetical to what he's doing. Now, now, now y'all got to hear me on this one. What God is doing by saving mankind and how he is doing it makes divisions untenable. You can't be in the plan and have divisions because the nature of the plan doesn't allow for it. And then he's going to finish. Beginning at verse 26, he's going to finish with showing them how it has worked itself out in their own local body, which I think is almost a direct application to any local body. So y'all with me? Y'all see how he's going to approach this thing, right? Because once you see it, the details will fill it out and give it color, but you'll know what he's trying to do. So let, let me show you his plea. Now, um, Y'all need to know that Paul, he has direct contact with this Corinthian church. He was the one who came and preached the gospel for the first time in Corinth so that this church was eventually established in Corinth. Now, when you think of what's happening here, don't think of modern church planting, right? Paul comes into there and there's no Christianity anywhere. So that when he leaves, they haven't formed a congregation like we think of where people come together regularly and meet in some place. Right. They are a loose knit group of people who are starting to take a hold of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are bringing with them all of their pagan baggage to it. And it has caused some natural misunderstandings because they haven't been fully discipled yet. And one of the things that this letter is going to do is to help to do that. Are you all with me? And so uh, Paul makes sure that they know that he knows that they are already, however, a gifted church. Th this is a church that is not lacking, he says, in any gifts. Right. But they are gifted and divided. Now, that, that, I, I had to bring that out, Dave, because it sounds a whole lot like the American church or the churches in America. We are gifted. Right. We are gifted, but we are divided. Gifted, but divided.
And, and then um, he's going to give his plea for their unity in verse, beginning at verse number 10. Y'all look at it with me. He says, now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all, y'all see what he asked them to do? He said, agree. <laughs> he, he didn't say be, be vaguely unified. He said, I want you all to agree. And then he says, and that there be no divisions among you but that you may be complete in the same mind and the same judgment. This is, this is important because Paul says, listen, when y'all come together and y'all and y'all don't agree, he said y'all need to find a way to have the same mind and res that results in the same judgment. He said, I I'm not saying... Uh, come together, and when you can't agree, for the sake of unity, say, well, we're not going to talk about it anymore. He said, same mind, same judgment. Come to the same conclusions. Now, for modern readers, that just sounds impossible, you know, because if, if we were to not be so religious and not so churchy, and if we could actually bring where we live into the place where we leave it out, let's, which is the church, I would say to you what Paul has just said, let's just agree on whether or not we are pro-life or pro-choice. Let's find the same mind about it. He said, no, 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 about, about how you vote as a church in America, whether it's Democrat or Republic, let's find a place that we agree. And everybody in the church said, amen, but it's not going to happen. Everybody in the church is thinking, yeah, this is, this is one of those hyperbolically religious uh, sermons where we say amen, but we walk out knowing I don't like so-and-so because he's not in my camp. And I, I and I know this, Coach. I, I I I would I would I would venture to believe that even in from in here, George. I don't I don't mean no harm. I may cause it a little, but I don't mean none. Um, if we got outside the doors and we brought up some of those topics, it'd get heated. It'd get heated. But what Paul is appealing to them is that heated or not, come to the same mind. Same judgment and agree. That's what he said. As big a task as that is. Now, now watch this. He says, th now this is the reason why I'm asking y'all to agree. He says, for I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by closed people, that there are quarrels among you. He says, y'all are fighting. <laughs> Y'all know what quarrels are, right? That, that is, y'all are fighting. Y'all are not simply disagreeing. Y'all are fighting about what you disagree about. And then he says this. Now, I mean this, that each one of you has divided yourself into factions. Y'all see that? They got factions going on. He says, um, some of you are saying, I am of Paul. And others are saying, I'm of Apollos. And then others are saying, I'm of Cephas. Y'all know that's Peter, right? And then he says, and some are saying, I'm of Christ. They're dividing themselves into factions, right? Now, it, for, for most of us, it reads a little silly, doesn't it? Their factions read a little silly, don't they? But I, I promise you, um, uh, when we enter the kingdom, so will ours. Uh, Y'all just going to have to take my word for that one. When we enter the kingdom and we look back at our factions, they're going to be as silly as I am of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas. And then, you know, the guy who trumps them all who says I'm of Christ. Now, on first reading, when I first read it, Twyla, my first thought is the guy who says I'm of Christ, that's, that's where everybody should be. Right? That's the faction to belong to, Right? But watch this. The arm of, pri of Christ, Paul includes in the factions because they're saying, I'm of Christ and not of, P of Paul like you. That's what they're saying. 
And, and y'all, I just, I just know it. I just have this, I have this, this historical church sense um, that comes out of my history and all of these, you know, Carolyn, these Sunday school hours that I have clocked, that, that there's some folks who would say, um, who would make the argument that the way to end this debate is they should all be of Christ. And they'd miss the point completely. They'd miss it completely. But Paul does not miss it. Um, but they, these are the factions they have. That's the description of their disagreement, of their division. And then Paul is going to put their divisions into um, an understandable place within reason. He's going to say, that whole argument is silly, essentially, because here's what he says. Has Christ been divided? He says, Paul was not crucified for you. And I can, just, I can just see as he starts to say those things, the people who say I'm of Christ are going, yeah, that's right. That's why I'm of Christ and I'm not of Paul because Paul didn't die for you. Jesus did. That's why I'm in the Jesus faction and y'all are not. <laughs> I can just see it. It would happen. And even after it's over, somebody's going to say, yeah, I heard everything he said, but y'all know he said I was right. And then he says, I thank God that I hadn't baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one will say that they were baptized in my name. And he says, then, then, then it's almost as if he, he had that, that same memory problem that I do and he remembers. But oh yeah, I did baptize, you know, a couple of y'all. If it was anybody else, I don't really remember. <laughs> That's what he says. And, and, but, but watch this. And here is where he starts to get to this place where he's going to transition into what God is doing in this whole salvation um, uh, history that he has taken up with mankind. Now, this is the part where y'all got to see it. Paul is going to start to address the divisions, but he's not going to do it by trying to figure out who's right. <laughs> this part is important because we always argue about who's right. And Paul is not going to talk about who's right. He's going to get at their motives for fighting for what they think is right. Now, see, that's the part we don't like to go to because we as humans say, well, we can't judge each other. But here's what we can do. We can look at the Bible that judges their hearts and say the Bible has already judged your heart. And when the Bible says this is what your motive is, that's what we believe. And he is going to suggest that if you find yourself in factions as a member of the body of Christ, here is your problem with your motive. And that's the part we don't like. Watch this. Here's what he's going to do. Beginning at verse number 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And then he's going to say this. This is where it's going to hinge. 17 and 18 is going to hinge right here. He says, but... Not in, and my translation says, cleverness of speech. Some of your translations may say words of wisdom, right? The, the actual, the actual um, words that Paul uses is the typical word for wisdom and then of word. It's the word logos. And Paul says, but he came, Jesus sent me to preach the gospel, but he didn't send me to preach it with clever speech or wise words. Because what Paul understands is divisions don't come from understanding the gospel. What they come from is the manipulation of words in human wisdom. Now, see, that's the part we don't understand because... Paul says, if you knew the Christ that you get from the Logos, it does not lead to factions, but y'all are fighting because you say you're in Christ and somehow you're supporting Christ with your divisions. And he said, but there's no divisions in Christ. What you're fighting over is your manipulative rhetoric. He says, your motive is bad. Y'all see it? 
He said, but I didn't come in cleverness of speech so that the cross of Christ would not be made void because that's what happens when we fall into this wisdom of words, this, this war of words. But, but here is the, here's the hinge, verse 18. And he's going to explain that verse 18 is an explanation of what he just said in verse 17. Now, how do you know that, Trevor? Because there's the explanatory word for, he's explaining, for the word of the cross, and Paul is going to use a word analogy, stay with him. He, he has just said, I didn't come in the, the rhetoric of words or the wisdom of words or the cleverness of words. He says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom, there's that word, the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of, and the cleverness I will set aside. Now, uh, George, this is one of those incredible things that I don't think most of the church knows about what God is doing in humanity. The, the way God set up his salvation in order to save humanity and to redeem the culture, he did it by using what we all would think is foolishness in order to set aside all of our wisdom that we use to argue about. It, let, me, let me make sure y'all see it. The word of the cross, that's, a, that's as in, in apposition to the word of wisdom. The word of the cross is foolishness to all of the folks who think they're wise. You, you always, he says, listen, what God did, he said, I'm going to do the, the most foolish thing I can do to show them that in their wisdom they have never found me. Because the wisdom that we have collectively has never led to God, has never led to an understanding of God. Let me say this as clearly as I can. Your position on abortion will never lead anybody to Christ. Did y'all hear me? What you think about gun control will never lead to faith in Christ. Whatever position you hold, it does not matter. It will not lead to Christ. Because it is that wisdom that's clever. That's all about words. Because what leads to Christ is the word of the cross. It's the word that leads to their death. It's the word that leads to our sacrifice. It's the word that leads to them giving up their position for somebody else. That's the word of the cross. The other is the word that leads to power. It's the other that, that, that leads to human wisdom. I, but I, I haven't convinced y'all yet, right? Come on, y'all y'all, y'all agree with me. I, you're not convinced, right? Well, you shouldn't be. Because Paul is not finished convincing them yet either. But so, so here's what he says. Now, as he is transitioning to what God is doing to save and how it makes divisions antithetical. Whatever your position is, it's antithetical. Even if you say, well, I'm of Christ, he said, that's not going to work. Watch this. He says, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? You know, culturally, the scribe was probably the wisest person there. They were the most educated people in the room. They worked with the writings, the law. He says, okay, now where are they? Where is the debater of this age? Has not, that's a rhetorical question. It's the, it's the question you already know the answer to, that sometimes we don't know the answer to. He says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. It didn't lead them there. Listen, we, we, we Christians are 
absolutely convinced in our culture that if we can, as a people, get abortion right, if we can get gender issues right, if we can get gun control and, and, and political voting and all of those things right, then our country is going to be a Christian somehow country. It's going to lead to Christ. And what does God say? It's not going to lead there. Because in all of that wisdom that y'all are fighting about, it has never led to God. It has never led to God. Watch this. <clears throat> they did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It's an amazing thing, Coach, what he has just done. He has just, he has just said, let me just cut all of the rest of that foolishness away that y'all are arguing about. And he says, what leads to Christ is the preaching of the gospel. Y'all see it? Um, and God would, through the foolishness of that activity, save people who believe. Y'all see the words? Come on, church people. Preaching the message that people think is foolishness, God will save those who act right. What they're saying is, if you can get this area right, if you can agree with me in this area, then I will share fellowship with you as a Christian. And Paul is saying, that has never led to God the preaching of the gospel, which is foolishness to you, God saves them through it, everyone who believes. The, ga the, the gates to the kingdom swing on belief. If you can believe it, you can be saved. God will save those who believe that foolish thing, even in our complex world. <clears throat> and then he says, <clears throat> verse 22, for indeed Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach a savior crucified. We preach a crucified Messiah. We preach a dying king, which he says is a stumbling block to the Jew. Listen, it's a stumbling block to anybody who thinks power is necessary. Because y'all got, got to see this in this context. He said, we didn't preach who was right. We didn't preach gather as many as you can to vote for what you believe into power. He said, we preach a savior, a messiah, that's the word Christ, it's not his last name. We preach the one who came to save. We preach God in the flesh as crucified. Yeah. Now that's just dumb. Yeah. Wait a minute, you, 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 you mean we're going to change the world by a guy who came and died? Yeah. I mean, a, a dying king? Yeah. A crucified Christ? Y'all need to get it. Y'all, if you believe that, you're the fool. <laughs> Y'all get it? He said, that's the foolishness that we believe. That's what all of this boils down to. Did y'all know that? All of y'all coming to church and buying Bibles and reading it in Sunday school, it comes down to a crucified Christ is what we believe. Why are y'all fighting about all the rest of that stuff? As if that's what makes us Christian. He said, for, for us, this is all about Christ crucified. That's what we 
preach is Christ crucified. That's a great question. When has that not been sufficient? Yeah. Not, not only sufficient for our salvation, but sufficient for our unity. Yeah. Yeah. He says, to the Jew, a stumbling block. <clears throat> and to the Gentiles, foolishness. For most of the world, it's a stumbling block and it's foolish. Yeah. Yeah. It's a stumbling block and it's foolish. You know, we, we, uh, so, some people see it. Chris, watch this. Some, pe some people actually see it. And they recognize that our struggles with all of these divisions are about power. They're about power. Who's going to be in control? And watch this. And then the gospel of Jesus comes along, and the guy with all of the power empties himself. Yeah. Yeah. Watch this. And in the emptying of himself, that's the language in Philippians, in the emptying of himself, he saves all of us. By the relinquishing of the power, he saves. We become one by the absence of the power. So in the argument, can you lose the power? Watch this. He says they're stumbling block to the Jew and foolishness to the uh, to the Gentiles. But to those who are the called both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Listen, here's what Paul just said. God did the he did the weakest thing he ever could do. Watch this to save us. Because I've always wondered that. Why couldn't God just, he, why couldn't he just flex? Why couldn't he just go change everything? Listen, he would have gotten all of the strong, Twyla. He would have made every knee bow by breaking their knees if he had just come and said, mm, I am him. I'm the man up in here. All the rest of y'all sit down, be quiet. But watch this. He chose the weakest thing he could do to demonstrate that his weakest is still more powerful than our strength. People are saying all the time, oh, man, I'm not sure what's going on today. Man, we must be in the end times because people sure are just, oh, they're, they're crazy. They're off the off hinge. You know, we're going to hell in the handbasket. Listen, sin started in the garden. It didn't start in America. America's doing what every great nation has always done. They're sinning because that's what sinners do. And God is not threatened by it. His kingdom is not in trouble. We don't, as a people, have to get together and flex our muscles in our country to save it from the culture. God is doing that through the foolishness of the message preached. And he is content with most people thinking that's foolish or a stumbling block. He's saying, okay, all of y'all in your wisdom run around like chickens with your head cut off trying to save America. You go right ahead, and I'm going to demonstrate my wisdom by saving some by a foolish message. That's what he said. <clears throat> so when we get to verse number 26... I like this. Watch this. Now he's going to say, now let me show you how that has worked itself out in Corinth. So let me show you how that works itself out at Fellowship Kima. And he says, for consider your calling. <laughs> I love this. I love this. He said, I want all of y'all to think about how you came to Christ right here. He, he says this. Think about your calling, brethren. There were not many wise according to the flesh among you. Y'all see it? Now, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Here's what I want y'all to see. In, in these verses from 26 down to 31, the, uh, the, re the repeated phrase is going to be, God has chosen. I'm going to say it over and over again. L let it sink in. But God has chosen. 
it, it ought to be a clue to you that you didn't choose anything. You didn't come to some knowledge. You didn't accept Jesus. God has chosen. Right? He's going to say that over and over. God has chosen. And then he's going to tell us what kind God chooses. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. If you're chosen, he's going to tell you what kind you are. He's going to talk about what kind God has chosen. And then he's going to say, and this is the reason God chooses those kind. And this is all to fix our division. Are y'all with me? Y'all want to see it? Watch this. He says, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. Kings don't usually come to church. Presidents come with a photo op, but they don't usually come to church. The, the, listen, the, there's some wealthy in here, but not many. There's some real smart folk in the world, but there ain't many in here. But we, we, don't, we don't believe that, though. In some places, they relish the idea that there's some smart people. We're some smart people in here. And he said, no, no, no. I want you to think about your, your place of worship, Corinth. He said, there's not many of y'all in there who are like that. And, in, and here's the first, but God has chosen, verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Y'all see what kind he chose? He chose the foolish. Why did he choose them? Come on, y'all say it with me. Why did he choose y'all? To shame the wise. <laughs> y'all see, wait a minute, let me, let me make this, Donald, let me, let me help this to sink in on you a little bit. When he said he chose the foolish, he talked about you. <laughs> you. You get it? I, 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 when I, when I loved it because I sent when George asked me, he said, "So what? You know, what, what, what's you know? Give me your information for the sermon tomorrow." The title was "God's Affinity for Fools." That's the kind he chooses. And the moment the fool starts thinking he's the wise, he falls in the fashion. He said, but God has chosen. And listen, and when there was, when there, when he could have chosen between mighty and noble, he chose the foolish. Why did he do it? So that all of the wise folk out there would realize your wisdom has never led to me. <clears throat> and look at the end of verse 27. There it is again. And God has chosen the weak things of the world, to shame the things which are strong. God doesn't need our strength to do his work. <clears throat> um, the weak things. He chose the weak. You know why? Because there's not many strong in here. He said, look around. There are no, there are no strong folks in here. Because God chooses a kind, and the kind he chooses is foolish and weak. That's you. And, and I don't say that's you because it's not me, but I'm preaching to you. <laughs> I've all, I, I mean, this preached to me later, uh, you know, back at home, but this is, he's talking about you. You who think you're wise and get into all of these word debates about these particular issues miss that the only reason you're in the body is because God has chosen you because you're weak and foolish. In order to shame the things which are strong, we are culturally, the American church is fighting for control of the American culture. Y'all need to hear me. We, we want desperately for our nation to be steered into a Christ-like direction. And we are fighting with our strength to get it to go there. Y'all know that's the essence of the division. Please help yourself to see it. We don't want... There to be abortions in our country because that's just not Christ-like. We don't, we don't kill babies 
here. And we're, 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 we're fighting for it. We, we have built uh, voting blocks for it. And we have divided for it. And Paul is saying, no, 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 that doesn't change the culture. What changes the culture is when God chooses. And he chooses the foolish and the weak. God does not need America to look like a Christian country for his kingdom's sake. America is not the city on a hill. That biblically is Jerusalem. God does not need that from us. What he needs is for those who are weak and foolish, who found life through that foolish message, to preach that foolish message to the culture. And then God will choose. He will choose. He will make his choice. And then it says, verse 28, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. Aren't y'all glad those are the kinds he chooses? Um, he says the base things. Y'all know what it means to be base? It, it, it gives the picture of a depravity. I mean, we, we are the, the, the ones he chooses are the base things. Not the lofty, those down here, the scum. The people who sin regularly who like their sin, who are in the dark and they prefer their darkness over the light. Watch this. And then Christianity in the culture wars are between, yeah, those are those people, they like darkness. They, they like to be in the dark all the time. We Christians don't like the dark. We like the light. And then he says, no, 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 God saved you from the dark. He chose you out of the dark. He chose the base. Listen, the people that we are standing aloof from are the kinds of people he chooses. That's the kinds of people we are. We are the base things. We are those things. He says God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. I, I like it, George. He reduces us to just things. Those foolish things. He's talking about people. Those base things. All you things he has chosen in order to nullify those things that are, so that man, no man, may boast before God. But by his doing, emphatic, you are in Christ. You are not in Christ because of the position you hold, the stance you take. You are not in Christ because you gave your life to him. You are not in Christ because you accepted Jesus as your personal savior. You are in Christ because you were base, weak, and foolish, and God chose you. You are not in Christ because you were born into a Christian culture and into a Christian nation, and you have all of these godly influences around you. You were chosen, you're in Christ because God has a kind and they are fools, and he chose you. It's by his doing that you are in Christ. Can y'all see now why factions are antithetical? The, the, the essential nature of a faction is to raise yourself above the others. You know, you can almost see them saying, you know, I am of Paul. Your chest goes out. And then somebody else one-ups him because Apollos, you know, he's a lot more eloquent speaker than Paul. That's what the scripture says. Well, I'm of Apollos because, you know, he can preach rings around Paul. And then somebody else says, yeah, but I'm of Peter because, you know, he was the rock upon whom Jesus built his church. And then somebody else saying, oh, no, but I got you. I'm of Christ. And everybody's going, ooh, I wish I'd have thought of it. <laughs> And, and now the one who is of Christ is above all of the rest of y'all. And he's saying, but if you're of Christ, you've been chosen because you're nothing. Because you're base, you're weak, you're a fool. 
And God chooses folks like that. Because here, by, by the way, that's who Apollos was, Paul was, and y'all know how pitiful Peter was before the coming of the Spirit. I mean, he was pitiful, man. Yeah, I like that. He was raggedy. I mean, the, the, you know, people say this, watch this. They say this all the time. Watch this, Frankie. I, I hear it. It breaks my heart all the time. They say, if you don't stand up for Christ in this culture, in this culture, and stand with, and then they name their faction, then God will deny you, Christ will deny you before the Father. That's what they say. And, and watch this. Who they learn that from? They learned it from the guy who denied him three times. <laughs> you, you, wait a minute, y'all missed that. Come on, y'all, you missed that. They heard it from the guy that God chose who denied him three times. And then watch this. And then after the resurrection, the Lord had to tell him three times that I love you. What's the point here, Javier? The lines we are drawing, God has not drawn. That's not the essential nature of Christ. He is not looking to simply stamp out sin yet. Because if that was his plan, he could have flexed and he could have done it. Y'all know at one time he is going to. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it will all be gone. Why y'all fighting to do what he's going to do in a moment? You don't have to fight those battles and form those factions and divide over those issues. God is choosing. And if all of the people who knew what kind he chose would just own who we are and give glory to God that he would choose nobodies like us to do it. We could be lights to this world. We could, we could actually let our light shine. And then in that humility, people could be led to Christ. If we only just knew how he was choosing to do it. Amen? Amen.